the chat before we begin. Um, firstly, please um, keep your mics on mute um, for the duration. We'll be fielding questions in the chat after Dr. Wodegaard's presentation. Um, also, to preserve um, bandwidth, because you know we have a kind of international thing going on here, and Dr. Wodegaard is in, in the Netherlands right now. So if you could please come off camera so we could make sure that um, there's no interruption in the bandwidth or in the connection, sorry. Um, and of course, now I would carry you on to Dr. Guy, who will be starting our presentation or our day today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you again for joining us. This is our fourth lecture. This morning we have Professor Eric Odegaard from the University of Leiden. I would like to thank again the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Fort of Spain, the National Trust of Trinidad and Tobago, and also we have several other partners. Well, I am from the Scarborough Harbor Project. But we'd also like to um, thank the Jubilee Library in St. Martin, the Ministry of Culture in the Netherlands, and several other organizations who have been very willing to participate and sponsor, co-sponsor. I would like to extend a lot of gratitude to Professor Barreton, who did an article in the Yesterday's Express on the project and the work that we are doing. And I must express my sincere gratitude to her. She you, was- You are very well, you are very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a, a fascinating series. I am only sorry that the article had to come out before this lecture, but that is a matter of the timing of my columns. Okay, thank you very much. And the lecture series will continue to January. The last lecture series, last in the lecture series would be a round table on the 28th of January. So we continue over the, except for the Christmas holiday, which is Friday, the 24th of December, but that's the only day that um, we do not have a lecture. So I just want to introduce uh, Mr. Patrick Caesar, who will take the proceedings forward. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and uh, good afternoon to those who are viewing from Netherlands and uh, wider Europe. It is indeed a pleasure to be here and to be given the privilege of introducing the next speaker. But I'll give you a bit of myself first about myself for those who may not know. My name is Patrick Caesar. I'm a retired civil engineer and project manager. I was born in, in Tobago, and I've known uh, Dr. Obiako since early, early school days, and we have been close friends for many, many years. As I said to her, I am extremely excited and enthusiastic about this project because of my own keen interest in history and especially in the history of Tobago. And even though I'm educated as a man of science, um, those of you in, in Tobago and uh, engineering, those of you in Tobago who may know me, uh, would also know that my mother was Oris Job Caesar, who was a history teacher and English teacher in Tobago, as well as a an author of several books on prose and poetry. As a matter of fact, she would have influenced my life a bit because I recently wrote a novel myself. Um, it's called Jimmy's World, an Island Story, and it's available on amazon.com as well as Nelson's Bookstore in Tobago. So, so that's a little plug for myself, um, Jimmy's World, an Island Story. But it is truly an honor um, to introduce our presenter um, this morning. So our presentation is going to be done by Dr. Eric Odegaard. Uh, Dr. Odegaard studied history at Leiden University in the Netherlands. He successfully defended his PhD there in 2018. Currently, Eric works for the Royal Picture Gallery, Moritz House. I had to learn how to pronounce that, Moritz House, <laughs> located in The Hague in the Netherlands. And also as a postdoc for the International Institute for social history. His project there covers the topic, investing in sugar and slavery, a financial history of Dutch Brazil. His presentation today is entitled, The Rockley Bay Campaign, 1676 to 1677, 
strategy, ships, and crews. I am certain, as in previous presentations, that this one should prove both interesting and informative, and I'm looking forward to it. So I present to you Dr. Odegaard. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for, uh, for those kind words. Good morning, everybody, or if you are in the Netherlands like me, good rainy, dreary, cold afternoon. Let's see, I will start sharing this. I need to share my whole screen because otherwise it didn't work out. All right, you should see the title screen now. Just checking that this uh, worked all right. Yes, we do, it works. All right, perfect. So what I would like to do today is look at the campaign mostly from the Dutch side, but I also have some, some French stuff to show you, uh, that ends in Rockley Bay in ultimately in December, 1677, and really ask the question why this particular um, fleet ends up in this particular island at this particular moment in time. So I, uh, I live uh, quite, quite close to the National Archives of the Netherlands in The Hague, so I could uh, last week uh, jump on my bike, go there and uh, photograph some of the archival documents relating to the campaign. So I have some uh, things that I hope are new to you that I can show, as well as some of the French uh, material. Now, when we talk about uh, the Battle of Rockley Bay, this then depicting the first Battle of Rockley Bay, this really is the inevitable uh, image. And one other thing that I would like to do is show how Romain de Hoge, the, the printer, the artist who made this print in the Netherlands, was able to make this what is a, a, a pretty good image for somebody who never went to Tobago. Um, and especially keep in mind these three smaller images at the bottom, because these will, these will come back, but in manuscript form. But this depicts uh, then uh, the French attack on the Dutch position in uh, Rockley Bay in March 1677. But there's a lot of the campaign that took place before this particular moment in time. So let's go back a couple of years and ask ourselves, um, why this fleet ends up in Tobago. Now, it's important to keep in mind that France and the Netherlands have been at war since 1672, but in the Caribbean, and if we include that to uh, sort of expand the region to also look at North and South America, there have been tensions for um, at least as far as the mid 1660s. So a French fleet takes Cayenne in 1664, which had been settled by mostly by uh, former inhabitants of Dutch Brazil. Um, and the outbreak of war in 1672 between the Netherlands and France is then seized upon as an opportunity to try and conquer French possessions in the Caribbean. And this results in the first case in the large uh, fleet under Admiral de Ruyter that tries to take Martinique in 1674, which fails. But interest hasn't abated yet. And from 1675, and then especially 1676, there is there are plans are being prepared in the Netherlands for a new attack on French interests uh, in the Caribbean. And this is in first instance conceived of as a large raid. But uh, and it's the, the Amsterdam Admiralty that's organizing uh, this raid. And the Amsterdam Admiralty now acquires the rights, the Dutch title to Tobago. And this is rather interesting because we, what we see in 1676 and 1677 is the Admiralty, so the Navy operating like a colonial government, which is not something that, um, what is something that is typical for this particular period in Dutch Atlantic history. The West India Company, uh, which had, for example, tried to conquer Portuguese Brazil in the 1630s and the 1640s, 
and which had established a colony in North America and what is now New York, had effectively gone bankrupt in 1674. Now, the successor company has been chartered, but by the, the late 1670s, this is still, they're still trying to get capital in, uh, there's still conflicts over the outstanding debt of the old company, so that the West India Company is in no shape to undertake any offensive action or start any new colonies. So it's the Admiralty of Amsterdam that takes over the title, the Dutch, the Dutch claims to Tobago from the province of Zeeland. So what is, starts as a raid campaign is then expanded into a large raid through French interests in the Caribbean, and then try and bring as much as many sugar planters with their enslaved Africans and all the equipment necessary to start a plantation colony on Tobago. And then bringing settlers in would allow the Admiralty to develop Tobago as a strong point in the Eastern Caribbean. Um, so why is Tobago then so interesting, so strategic? Um, well, as has been mentioned before in a previous lecture, it is a natural point of connection between the mainland of South America and the islands further north. It is also directly uh, athwart the shipping routes that ships coming from West Africa, but especially also South America. So think of the Guyanas where the Dutch can try, continue to try and establish settlements, but also Brazil will take, ships will follow the current and the winds into the Caribbean. And then having a strong point at Tobago places you very well to be able to cut these lines of communications in war. Um, so this is, I think, something, a reason why the Admiralty especially is interested in this. Um, now, of course, the attempt by the late, six, the second half of the 1670s to settle Tobago for the Dutch is not the first Dutch attempt to settle Tobago. This is, I here have a list, this is from the archives in Zealand, a list, the first page of a list of inhabitants of Nova Walcheren, New Walcheren, in July 1668, uh, when the colony was still claimed by the province of Zealand. What is interesting here, um, from my view, I mostly study Dutch Brazil, and there's quite a few people who were in Brazil in the 1640s and the 1650s, who then ultimately end up in Tobago a decade later. But you can also see, um, a very varied population here. There are Europeans, there are Frenchmen, there are free, uh, there's a free black man in, on this list. There's also, uh, let's see, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. The 12th name from the top, Maurice Perapawa, which who is a, a Brazilian Native American with his wife and daughter. So uh, we know from other sources that uh, local allies of the Dutch from Brazil relocated to Tobago after the fall of Brazil, but this is one of the few ones where we actually know who shows up in these population records. But what happened then to this colony? Well, um, a large number of people left for Suriname in the late 1660s and in 1672 when war breaks out between the Dutch Republic and France, but also England. Um, Tobago is conquered from, uh, by English troops coming from Barbados and the whole population is deported to Barbados. So the whole colony ends at that point. So by 1676, 1677, when uh, in the, the campaign that we'll look at today, it's tried to reestablish a colony. It really has to be reestablished from scratch. There is no existing Dutch or colonial Dutch population left. Um, so it's the Admiralty of Amsterdam that run, effectively runs the show and it's all Admiralty of Amsterdam ships then that are sent to uh, Tobago. Um, one of those, we have a nice, we're fortunate enough that the Van de Velde, father and son, made very nice uh, pen paintings or drawings 
of almost every ship in the Dutch fleet in this period. So this is the Huis de Kruininger, the wreck, which is now at the bottom of, uh, of the bay, uh, 56 guns. This is a rather interesting ship in and of itself. If we look briefly at, at some of these ships, I think we can put the whole uh, campaign not only in a wider Caribbean context, but also in a wider global context. For this ship um, was originally built on behalf of the Republic of Genoa in the early 1650s in Amsterdam. But Genoa wanted to expand its fleet with large sailing warships. It had previously had only uh, war galleys. Uh, but didn't have the technological know-how to build ships like this. So they put an order in with a private yard in Amsterdam to build two very large, for that time, sailing warships. This one, this is the smaller of the two, also nicknamed then the small Genoan. Um, and when war breaks out with England in 1652, both ships are taken on by the Admiralty of Amsterdam. So the Huis de Kruiningen, its career starts, or the reason it's built is a Mediterranean reason. It'll end its career in the, the Caribbean. Its sister ship, Huis de Zwieten, the large gentleman, um, will be sold in the 1660s to the Dutch East India Company, sails to Batavia, what is now Jakarta. Uh, it serves as the, the flagship of the Dutch fleet during the siege, the first siege of Cochin in West India. It will be captured by the English in the Second Anglo-Dutch War, and it will uh, be used by the English as a block ship during the Dutch raid on the Chatham. So we have two ships. The story starts in the Mediterranean. One ends sunk in England, and the other will end in Tobago. Um, and Huis de Kruining is the largest ship in the, the small fleet that is being put together for this uh, Caribbean uh, campaign. So we have Huis de Kuining of 56 gun, uh, guns, Bescherming of Beschermer. They alternate a little bit depending on which document you uh, look at. 50 guns and then a number of other uh, and mostly smaller ships, as well as down below Zaire, Fortuyn, Sfera Mundi, and Gouden Munich, some supply ships. And these ships leave the Republic in March. 1676. Now, the first stop on the campaign is not Tobago, but Cayenne, where the ships arrive in early May 1676. So Cayenne had been, the French had claimed it, or claimed to have, have sort of taken possession of the island. And I think we, can, we are right now to be slightly cynical about Europeans sailing around the world and claiming whatever they can get their hands on. But European powers at the time took these claims very seriously. So although there was no French settlement when veterans of Dutch Brazil came to Cayenne in the later 1650s and the early 1660s, France still claimed ownership and takes possession of the colony in 1664. So the first stop for uh, uh, for the fleet, commanded by Jacob uh, Benkes, you know, older literature calls him Benkes, um, is the reconquest of Cayenne, which uh, you can see the, uh, the fort on the hill. Actually, the French had put up a defense around the town because the Jesuits didn't want their uh, church and uh, facilities to be left outside of the defensive perimeter, which meant that the defense was a bit too wide the defenders had to cover too wide a front. Uh, the Dutch troops from the fleet stormed the place and they take it, uh, leaving a small garrison in place. The fleet then sails on. Now, of course, from, from Cayenne, Guyana, we could think, oh, it would be natural to go to Tobago then, but they don't. Actually, they go first to Marie Galante. So off of uh, Guadeloupe. The fleet tries to intercept a number of French ships that they see entering, uh, uh, Marie uh, entering Guadeloupe in June, but the French ships evade them. Now, um, uh, Guadeloupe itself is a bit too large and a bit too well defended to tackle, but 
neighboring small Marigaland is just the kind of place that the fleet can take. Um, so the, the, the planters of the island have to pay an indemnity the fleet takes on, and this is especially important for the later plan to settle Tobago, takes on enslaved Africans who had worked on the plantations on Marigaland, takes them on board and they will come to Tobago. Um, as well as a number of planters with their equipment. So this is a map from the uh, Bibliothèque Nationale de France. Anywhere you see BNF, that's the French National Library. They have a very good website at BNF, BNF Gallica, and they have a lot of scanned maps and images. Also for Tobago, we will see some later on. So if you want to look at the maps again, this is a very good place to... Uh, to go. Um, from Marie-Galante, they go to Saint Martin, Saint Martin, which is plundered. Here, the French do put up a defense, do put up a fight. Um, but again, the numerical advantage of the fleet and the soldiers on the fleet, and the fact that these are all professional soldiers rather than uh, uh, hastily put together colonial militia. That carries the day, and the same thing happens on Marie Galante. That the number of uh, slaves are taken on board, a number of planters are taken on board who want to come to Tobago, and the population has to fund, pay an indemnity. Um, and which is interesting throughout this cruise through the Caribbean, attacking French interests, is that Benkes uh, reflects on the possibility to develop these colonies or these places that he's captured into profitable colonies for the Dutch Republic. So uh, he also remarked that Cayenne was a very prosperous place and that could become not just a colony, but what he called a landschap. Um, and I think he's referring to a rather different political relationship between motherland and colony that could develop if it was properly settled, which of course it never happens. Um, and on Saint Martin, he uh, Saint Martin, he ref, uh, reflects that in good hands, so under a good governance, it might yet become a considerable place to plant tobacco of the kind lacking in Holland and necessary for the eastern, that is Baltic and northern trades. So here again, I think we can see how these Caribbean uh, ventures fit into a larger uh, global uh, trade network and sort of a weighing of Dutch interests. So uh, Benke sees the value of, of a Caribbean island like St. Martin, Martin in that it will provide resources that can serve in the Baltic trade. Now off of St. Martin on the 29th of June, the fleet splits up and Hendrik Karloff, who we'll talk a, a bit more about a bit later on, uh, who, he's the designated governor of Tobago is detached with four ships. So the Huis de Kuiningen, the Agatha, the Middelburg, and the Sire, which is a, a victual uh, flute uh, supply ship. He will sail to Tobago directly and Benkes will continue his raid through the Caribbean. But um, Karloff mentions, and this is interesting because we have letters from Karloff to, uh, to the Netherlands where he talk, tells about what happens here. Uh, he says that uh, just after this splitting of the fleet, uh, that Jan Bond, the captain of the Agatha, said that he had sprung a leak and that he would need to uh, sail to the Virginias, so North America, to repair his ship and that he would then return to Tobago. But this was an excuse on Bond's uh, side because he didn't go to North America, he went to Spain and then back to the Republic. Um, where ultimately he is put, he's tried for treason or for abandoning his post, and he is uh, actually condemned to death and executed in Amsterdam in February 1677. Now, why did this happen is an interesting point to reflect. Um, we know later on that Karloff is uh, put on trial by Benkes and the, the Council of War on Tobago. And he's also sent back to the Netherlands because apparently Karloff had been badmouthing Benkes to the captains of his own small fleet on the way to Tobago. 
apparently trying to incite them to put him in charge, uh, although Karlov himself denied any, anything uh, of this. So perhaps uh, Jan Bond, having enough of this, uh, decided to, uh, to opt to leave rather than remain in, in, this, in the presence of Karlov. Um, Karlov himself had a rather interesting Atlantic career. He started out as a soldier for the Dutch West India Company in Brazil, serves in Chao Tome, becomes fiscal in Elmina, in what is now uh, Ghana. Um, and he helps found both the Swedish and the Danish Africa companies, um, helping to found what is now a Cape Coast castle. First for the Swedes, and when the Swedes want to kick him out, he goes to Denmark, Sweden and Denmark are then at war, and he says, hey, do you want to have an African fort? Because I know where you can get one. Um, and the Danes take over. And by the early 1670s, Karlov is back in the Dutch Republic and he's one of the driving forces for the whole uh, Tobago campaign. And which is why he is he's designated as the, as the governor, which he will never serve us because he'll be sent back to the Republic quite soon. So while Karlov is on his way to Tobago, um, Benkes continues to uh, send the Mang, or what, what's now uh, Haiti, uh, taking 16 ships in the Bay of uh, Petit Guave in July 1672. And there's a nice list in uh, Benkes continued to send back letters to the Dutch Republic, both to Stadtholder William III, or later also King of England, William III, uh, the Admiralty Board of Amsterdam, and the Raadspensionaris, which you could compare to a sort of prime minister-like function, Casper Fasel. So we have a number of, a fair number of letters from bankers throughout his, his Caribbean cruise. And this is a list of the ships that were taken, the French uh, merchantmen that were taken in uh, the Petit Goave. And then from the last letter that we have before uh, Benkes arrives in Tobago, is uh, signed as north of the Caicos, so north of the Turks and Caicos Islands. So on the map here, I've tried to plot out what could be the course. Cayenne falls on the 5th of May. The fleet is at Marigaland in June. Saint Martin, by the end of the month, then the fleet splits up. Karlov sails to Tobago directly, which he reaches by early August. And um, Benkes continues his cruise to uh, the Petit Guave, then out through the Atlantic north of the, uh, the Caicos and to Tobago, which he reaches in on the 21st of September, 1676. So it's a, it's a quite a large uh, swing out into the ocean. Um, Likely he catches the right currents in the Atlantic so you can come to Tobago from the east because Karloff had left St. Martin or the fleet had split up by the end of June. And it takes him quite a while from St. Martin to reach Tobago, whereas uh, Benkes doing the whole extra loop arrives uh, some, uh, something like a month and a half later. So Karlov has to, to beat against the current to get there. Now on Tobago, Karlov remarks in his letters, which he had sent before he's arrested and sent back to the Netherlands, that they hadn't started building the fort yet, but they had started by planting, uh, especially potatoes, but also some other food crops, which would come in handy. Um, but we'll get to the fort in a bit. So this is a map, a manuscript map of Tobago that is, was sent as an, uh, sort of an addition to one of the letters that Benkes had sent to, to the Dutch Republic. So, um, well, the North is, uh, is up there. And then we have Rockley Bay in the uh, lower left-hand corner. This, map of Tobago is the little map of Tobago in the, the print 
of the battle that you see below in the corner. Um, then there is this image, which is rather interesting. This is part of an engineer's report on where to build the fort. So we're looking into Rockley Bay and there's a number of hills uh, to the right side. So that's sort of roughly east, northeast, uh, starting with A, which is in the document is described as the highest mount mountain and that commands the two peaks of well, it's called, called a mountain by the engineer, but it's a hill. Or yeah. he's a Dutchman, so anything is a mountain, I guess. Uh, but these two peaks command the top of that hill, which commands this hill, which would be suitable to dominate the hill where E on this, this image where the fort is actually going to be built. So for an engineer, this is a, a problematic. Uh, position because you don't want to build a fort on a position where it's dominated by higher ground within reach a uh, range of artillery. But then the engineer uh, continues and he says, and this is my translation, that since the mountains are divided by waterfalls and thick forests and on the other bay, so that would today be uh, Minister Bay, I guess, uh, lay a swamp, the mountain E was chosen by Commander Benkis Karloff, all officers, and myself. So although the fort, the location of the fort is dominated by higher ground within range of artillery, they're going to go ahead with building the fort there anyway, because they don't think that you can get a gun up on especially hill D uh, to bombard the fort. And this is uh, going to come back to haunt them. We will see. Now, to build the fort, this again, these are images from uh, Benkis's letters to uh, the Netherlands. Originally, he had wanted to build a lar rather larger uh, square, four bastion, sort of your staple design of, of fort building with a nice profile here. But it soon turns out that this is too ambitious because once the fleet reaches Tobago, uh, disease, illness sets in amongst the crews and the soldiers on board. Um, the mortality for the crews is now very high. Many people are dying. Uh, the rains are come setting in. So this is an earthwork fort and a lot of the work simply washes away in heavy rains. So it's designed, uh, decided that a rather smaller fort, Esterreschans, uh, which is really a, a field fortification, will be built first so that at least there is a strong point in case the French come to counterattack, and that once the, the, the earthwork, the Stedeschans is finished, they can continue working the, the larger fort. Now, look at the little dots above the, the square fort and below the, uh, the Stedeschans here. These are scale bars, but this is a scale bar of 10 uh, Rhineland rods, which would uh, come out to something like 37 meters. And this is a scale bar of 30 Rhineland rods, so about 100 meters. So if, if we were to scale this properly, the, the Stereschans is less than the size of one of the bastions of the original fort. So it's really very small, which is convenient in a way because you can finish it quite quickly. It's uh, less than ideal in another way uh, because it's if you can get a gun in position to start firing on this, or as we'll see, a mortar to start firing explosive shells into this fort, the fact that it's so small and that it's going to be crowded with men, with guns, with munition, means that every shot is going to be a, be a hit. Uh, this is like shooting ducks in a barrel or fish in a barrel. Um, the larger fort, the larger interior surface of the larger fort means that the chance that uh, incoming mortar grenade is going to hit something crucial are rather smaller. Uh, but uh, necessity uh, sort of makes the choice and the smaller fort is built in the location that the uh, engineer had proposed. 
Now we come to the first battle. So the loss of Cayenne had not gone unnoticed in France, of course, and the fleet is being equipped actually at the initiative of the Admiral, the Admiral, the Vice Admiral of the Ponant or the Atlantic fleet who will lead it, which is Jean Destrey. Um, and from February, 1677 onwards, Benkes, <clears throat> Here's reports about French ships scouting around Tobago. Uh, on the 20th, I think it's there's a number of small French ships that are seen measuring the depth of the bay. The Dutch fleet is now anchored uh, inside the bay, supported by a shore battery at the fort. Disease and uh, so sickness and death amongst the crews of the Dutch ships mean that the Dutch fleet can't really maneuver anymore because there's not enough manpower left to man the guns, to put the ships under sail, so do the rigging, et cetera, and garrison the fort at the same time. So the ships have to be anchored in line. It's purely passive defense so that everybody can man the guns, supported by the shore batteries of the fort. So the image that you see here on the left-hand side is one of the images that one of the drawings that Benkes sent back to the Netherlands in his report, his after action report for the, the action of March 3rd, 1677. And the right hand side, where you can already see what's going to happen, um, is one of the images on the Bibliothèque Nationale de France's website. Now, Jean Destay wasn't a naval officer originally, he was an army officer who transfers to the Navy in the 1660s. He's one of the favorites at court, uh, Louis XIV. Um, so he rises quite rapidly through the Navy ranks to become vice admiral of the Atlantic fleet. Um, what he tries to do in March 1677, and he had previously already taken Cayenne. So Cayenne, which Benkes had captured, is already lost to the French. He's gone to Martinique to take in uh, supplies and reinforcements, and then he has made his way to Tobago. He also lands troops, and he tries to crack open the Dutch defense of the bay by a combined naval attack into the face of the guns of the fleet and the shore batteries, and a land attack on the fort. And given the French, the French ships are larger, they are still well manned, they have more guns, on average, heavier guns as well. Um, and by March 1677, the Dutch ships and the crews especially have been gone from the Netherlands for almost a full year. So wear and tear is quite high on the Dutch fleet. The French fleet is still quite fresh. So the advantage really is on the French side here. And initially, the French attack goes well, sort of as planned, until um, Captain Rumer Flak of the Huis de Kreuninge, the ship we saw, looked at earlier, the little Genoan, um, when he is surrounded by two French ships firing at his ship, the, I think about 50 men of his crew have already died, uh, he decides to blow up the vessel rather than surrender, um, and which he does. The ship blows up. Rumor Flak, ironically or interestingly, survives uh, the explosion, but the fire quickly spreads to more ships that are entangled with one another. Rigging has become entangled in the narrow confines of the bay and also to the Dutch merchantmen and supply ships, uh, some of which had on board um, both enslaved Africans, but also uh, women of the settlers uh, who were supposed to be uh, building the colony, um, also burn. So mortality in the battle is really high. Destre retreats uh, in the face of this disaster. And after the battle, actually both sides claim victory, the Dutch because they're still in possession of the bay and the French because the Dutch had lost seven ships and the French had only lost four ships. Um, but 
uh, with the force that remains to him, Destre can't make another assault. So he ultimately goes back to France to get more ships, more men, and try again. There we go. Now the second French attack. So Destre comes back in December, 1677. So between March 1677 and December 1677, Bankes and his men are still stuck in the bay. Um, they have a number of ships remaining to them, one of which is Bankes' flagship, the Beschermer. But again, mortality, both diseases and uh, uh, combat deaths are so high that they can't man the ships to sail out. Um, so they're really stuck at the bay. What they have left is hoping that the letters that Bankus keeps sending to the Dutch Republic, and most of these are taken by uh, merchantmen visiting to Barbados, and from Barbados they reach uh, the Netherlands. He, he can only hope that his letters mean that a relief fleet is being organized in the Netherlands. Uh, so that, that not only the French, but also the Dutch will get reinforcements. This doesn't happen. And I'll look at why this doesn't happen, why no relief fleet is organized in the Netherlands a bit later on, almost done. But in December 1677, Destre comes back to Tobago with, again, a larger fleet, uh, more men, but this time he doesn't risk the frontal assault with his fleet in the now wreckage strewn uh, Rockley Bay, but he chooses the indirect approach. So here we have the fort. This is Rockley Bay. This is, I've been looking on Google Maps. This is Minister Bay, I think. So the French troops land here, march overland. Remember that engineer's report, which said, okay, there's a number of hills here that are sort of strategic high ground, but we don't expect troops to be able to land here because it's a marshy area. Well, the French do. And ultimately they set up camp here, which is that last height that dominates the fort. And they set up a battery of, this again is a French map, a very suitable illustration here, a mortar battery that opens fire on the Dutch fort. And so we have the landing zone, the route towards the camp where they can bombard the Dutch fort. And on the 12th of December, 1677, just quite shortly actually after the bombardment starts, a lucky hit uh, hits the gunpowder storage on top of which there was the, the uh, you could call it the officer's mess, but that would be a little bit too uh, grand uh, description. But the gunpowder stores go up uh, taking Benkis and almost all the officers in the garrison with them, and the fort surrenders shortly thereafter. So Benkis never leaves Tobago uh, after he arrives in September 1676. And then the last Dutch ships in the bay that you can see here are also taken, one of which is the is Benkis's flagship Beschermer. So the French win. But so far, far in the French campaign, the French have had to react. Oh. I think somebody has a microphone on. All right. Um, almost done. Don't worry. Um, so far, the, the French have had to react to Dutch moves. So they had to react to the taking of Cayenne. They had to react to uh, the, the plundering of Marie Galante and St. Martin. They had to react to the Dutch occupation of Tobago, but now Destre can take the initiative. So he resupplies his fleet, he reinforces his fleet, and he had actually already on the way to Tobago the second time he had taken uh, Gore off of West Africa, now Senegal. Uh, and now he sets his sight on another island. He wants to take Curaçao, which is, of course, the main Dutch possession in the Caribbean. And uh, here, let's see, ah, oh, too far. 
um, he runs into quite literally uh, Las Aves Island, which is really a, a reef with a small island on the way from St. Kitts to Curaçao in May, 1678. So this is, this is the before image, but you can already see in fine outline here what happens is that, there we go, um, the fleet hits the reefs and all the ships, well, not all the ships, but most of the fleet is actually lost. And we have here, if I can show it. Yeah, here's Defenseur, which is the French renamed Beschermer, the flagship, the Dutch flagship of Benkes, which is now also lost, not at Tobago, but at the Ile de Aves uh, on the way to Curaçao. And this ends the French campaign, or does it? Um, there's, a, there's a little closing off to what happens here. Now, why didn't the Dutch get reinforcements on Tobago? Because um, the, the Admiralty and the Stadtholder were aware of what was happening uh, in the Caribbean. I think part of the answer has to be that the Dutch Republic isn't fighting just in the Caribbean, but uh, the war against France really is part of a larger global, or it is a global conflict. And at exactly 1676, 1677, a large fleet is being sent to the Baltic to support the Danes against the Swedes. And the Baltic trade is especially important for Amsterdam. So already by May 1676, two months after Benkes leaves, in the remaining correspondence of the Admiralty Board of Amsterdam, we can see that the two most important topics are the equipping the fleet for the Baltic and supporting uh, the Mediterranean fleet and the Mediterranean traders, uh, the directors of the Levantine trade. So I think simply, Benkes and his letters are crowded out of the attention span of the, of the Admiralty in Amsterdam by the unfolding crisis in the Baltic. Uh, and while we see a very significant force being sent to the Baltic, no substantial reinforcements reach Benkes in the Caribbean. Uh, and the French can make a, a different uh, sort of prioritization of their interests. But the French fleet then ultimately is also lost. Destrée again survives and uh, goes back to France. But there are a number of aftermaths to the conflict. One of them is what we see in especially the notarial records in Amsterdam. This is a declaration, uh, December 1678, of the, the writer on board the Beschermer who has now has to testify that soldiers and sailors who had died before the battle had actually made their wills on board ship. But of course, the will has been lost either by the fire or because the ship later sank. So he now has to go to a notary and testify what he remembers of the, the depositions that the uh, people had made. So there's a lot of that in the Amsterdam archives. There's also a number of interesting descriptions of soldiers who had and sailors who had been kept, made uh, prisoner by the French talking about their experience on Tobago and then later being deported to Martinique and then to France and then make their way back to the Netherlands. The English have to butt in right at the end so the calendar of state papers records that, uh, again, December 1678, um, there is a conflict between the Admiralty of Holland, which is in this case, the Admiralty of Amsterdam and Governor Stapleton. Um, and this is a quote from the description from the, the calendar of state papers. So this is not my phrasing. Um, about certain Negroes carried from Tobago to the Leeward Islands. The King's grant of his right entitled to said Negroes to Governor Stapleton and that he may dispose of them as his majesty's free gift. So what the English King had done when 
the ships burnt and then the fort fell. Before the, the ultimate fall of, of what remained of Dutch Tobago, the enslaved Africans had been, as far as they, they were still alive, had been let go into the interior of the island to try and keep them out of French hands. The English king now grants the right to capture these people to uh, Governor Stapleton to take them to the Leeward Islands. In December uh, 1678, the Admiralty of Amsterdam start, starts to protest that legally these people were still their property and not Governor Stapleton. So that's a that's a rather interesting sort of postscript to the whole campaign. Um, I'm not quite sure how that conflict ends though. That would be interesting to look into. Um, by the early 18th century, when the French start making maps about Tobago again, there we have the ruins of the fort on top of the hill. And this is what remains of the settlement. This is sort of the area where the, the village was. And there's one final conflict that plays out in the aftermath of all this fighting, which is that the Dutch West India Company operating out of Curaçao starts to salvage the guns of the French ships on uh, Aves. And then the French start to protest because the French will ultimately set up their own cannon salvaging operation, will protest that these were their guns and the, the West India Company really had to butt off uh, and, and keep their hands off. Uh, and there's an interesting legal case about that in the, the Amsterdam archives as well. Is this entirely the end of the Dutch interest in Tobago? Not quite. As late as the 1740s, there is a document in the Stadtholderly papers in the Dutch National Archives where an anonymous author argues that control of Tobago really is crucial to maintain the security of the colonies in the Guyanas, because any force established on Tobago could easily sweep down the coast, plunder uh, especially Suriname, and then um, sail back before any action could be taken. So interest remains, but the ability to to follow up this interest with action is is now lost. So Benkes is. Uh, Rockley Bay campaign of 1676-1677 is really the last chance for Dutch Tobago and the, the loss of his force means that effectively speaking the Dutch are now out of uh, Tobago history and that's it thank you for your attention and I hope you have lots of questions Thank you so much, Dr. Odegaard, for that fantastic lecture. Um, I, I'm sure I'm not speaking for myself when I say those illustrations. I myself have never seen many of them, and it was really refreshing to see some of those illustrations and how you use those illustrations to relay the story. So thank you so much for that. Um, so we will invite questions now and and you know from past experiences from past lectures we like to put the questions in the, in the chat so could you please i see one in the chat so far so could you please take this opportunity now to start placing your questions in the chat and i'm sure you have many questions okay so let's start okay so the first question um this person asks did the artists document the events concurrently? So I'm, I'm guessing were there any people on the ships documenting these events concurrently or did they capture the events after relay of information? Uh, so for some of these, so the, the, the drawings of the fort, so those, those ground plans, those were drawn either by Bankers or, or the engineer with the fleet at Tobago when they were, um, the, the engineer will need to have sort of drawn up a plan to make sure that all the, the firing lines are correct. Um, probably there will have been more uh, sort of sketches made before construction began, but this was then a formal set of drawings sent back to the Netherlands to inform the Admiralty 
and the stadtholder and the government of, okay, so this is what we're doing. Uh, but that, yeah, those images were made um, on Tobago. That battle line of the, the so Benkis is drawing of the first battle of Rockley Bay is also made on Tobago because that's one of the things that he sent along with the letter and uh, sort of the legend to the to the description. So there's an image and then in his letter he has A is the ship Huis de Kleininger, B is the ship Beschermer, et cetera, et cetera. So that's also drawn. Uh, those are then used in the Netherlands to make that uh, that image that's also the background image for the whole lecture series. Um, so I think um, the images that I saw in the Dutch National Archives were uh, letters sent either to the Admiralty Board or to the Raadspensionaris, which is like Prime Minister-ish role, uh, Kasper Fagel, but they are copies of letters that Benkes sent to the stadtholder, William III, later William III of England as well. Um, and uh, the maker of the image, so the image that's the background for the whole lecture series, uh, had a very good working relationship with William III. He's the chief uh, sort of propaganda officer for William III. So whenever in the war with France, there's anything that could be classified as a Dutch victory, there will be a very nice print made and distributed throughout all of Europe. Um, so I think that Romain de Hoge, the artist who made that print had access to the letters. William III gave him access to the letters that Benke sent so he could try and reconstruct an idea of what the battle must, must have looked like with the coastal profile, so the, the mountains or hills, um, if they'd be a mountain to me, I guess, um, the, the plan of the fort and the, uh, the map of Tobago that's also shown at the bottom of that print. Those are very clear copies of the manuscript images that, that Benke sends. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Okay, so... We have another question. Um, do you know of any um, wooden models built of the Hoogstead Königin? Do you know of any, have you ever seen any models maybe in, in Holland or anywhere like that? Of the Huis de Kroeninger? Yeah. No. Um, not that I, I, as far as I'm aware, and wooden ship models for Dutch warships in the 17th century are really very rare, especially if they are, not just sort of generic showpiece models, but really portray a specific ship because of the shipbuilding process. So um, naval ship construction in England uses models and, and sort of half models in a way to plan the lines of a ship. And in England, ships are built according to drawings. That isn't yet the case in the Dutch Republic. Ships are built, um, there will have been a list, I'm still looking for this because I really want to write a book about the whole Genoa built ships in the Netherlands and they end up all over the world. Um, but there will have been a sort of a, a list made of the ship has to be this long, this wide, this deep, carry this many guns. And then the shipbuilder, on, based on that list, knows how to start constructing the ship. Mm. So there's no construction drawings either. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's no ship models, um, okay. but there are a lot of, there are quite a few images of the ships. So the Kruininger and her larger sister, the Zwieten, uh, by the, both Van der Veldes and uh, Reinier Noom. No, uh, but uh, yeah, Nooms. Um, the National Gallery, is National Gallery in Washington DC has a very nice, painting of the Zwieten, um, but unfortunately, no models. Okay, thank you. Um, and I, ju I would just like to take this opportunity to say that we have a lecture coming up by Professor Jan de Vries on this very same um, topic. So he may be able to state more about that, um, especially on the again. again. Um, moving on, I have a question by our chairman, Margaret McDowell. She, uh, she says, um, of course, excellent pre presentation. And I too was blown away with the diagrams and maps of the course. 
the research that enabled us to now see, and the research that have enabled us to now see them, how much of this information is presented to modern naval strategists to determine how similar the thinking is now in approaching plans for conflict. So I'm guessing um, but the Ms. McDowell is asking if these strategies used in the past may inform strategies. I don't know, I don't know why she's asking about strategies to attack Tobago. I don't know if um, there's any plans to attack no, I'm, Tobago. <laughs> I'm not sure for this uh, for this particular battle, uh, although I do know that that sort of naval war colleges here in the Netherlands, but also in Britain and the US do look back mm -hmm. on sort of campaigns from this period to look at, okay, so how, how do admirals work with whatever sort of tools they have on hand? Um, mm -hmm. I think if you, if you look at this um, campaign and sort of want to distill lessons for um, how to, or perhaps how not to run a, run a campaign, I think it really underlines the importance of logistics um, mm -hmm. And the fact that Destray can go back to France, raise a new fleet, and then come back to Tobago before the Dutch get their act together and, and get any kind of reinforcements in, um, really, it, it pays either it pays a compliment to the French organization or says something about the Dutch disorganization. Mm -hmm. I suppose. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I too am interested in. Let's see, how can I say this? I'm interested in prisoners of war. It was asked before in a previous um, lecture, but maybe you have more information on this, seeing that you studied the battle specifically, but what would happen to maybe French prisoners, prisoners of war after the first campaign, but before the French come back, or even after ah, that, yeah. what would happen to them? I'm not sure what happens to any French prisoners they make during the first campaign, first battle, um, because the also the French losses are quite severe in the first battle, also on land, not just on the naval side, but the land attack on the fort is also repulsed. Um, it could be so. What is a, a usual way to deal with prisoners in this period? Um, because you don't want to have hundreds of prisoners hanging around, not only because it's a threat, but also, especially in this situation, you have to feed them. And then you have to detach people to guard them. So that's a that's a tremendous waste of resources. So what they often do is parole prisoners and simply say, okay, we'll put take down your name. You're going to sign this, promising that you will not fight us, either depending on sort of the skill of the disaster that you've just inflicted on the enemy. But you can say, okay, either you're not going to fight us in this conflict anywhere in the world, or you can't fight us in the Caribbean for the next six months, or uh, you can only fight us in Europe. And then you set them on a ship and you send them back to Martinique. Um, and that's fascinating. So, so <laughs> I, could, I could see that happening. I don't have that. I um, don't think I came across that in the records that I read, but I wasn't really, really looking for it either. So I might have to look at that again because there are ships coming in occasionally from Barbados, there are a number of merchantmen that visit Tobago. When the first battle takes place, there's actually, for example, there's a Portuguese merchantman from Brazil in the bay, which had pulled into Tobago because it had sprung a leak on the way back to Europe. So you follow the current from Brazil, you have to follow the current along the South American coastline, and then you can make the swoop back to Europe. So Tobago is a natural place for a Portuguese ship to pull in. So perhaps if something like that comes along, you can put them on a neutral ship and take them out. Um, I do know uh, there are a couple of reports for Dutch prisoners about what happens to them after the battle. But of course, in that situation, the French simply can take the Dutchmen aboard as they leave Tobago, I think first to, after the second battle to Martinique, there they can put everybody on land and then it's the problem for the governor there. Uh, wow. As they, uh, plans his, his further moves. So I, I guess that system kind of depends on the person's innate honor, I guess, because what stops well, them really from coming back? You know? 
also, um, you have their names and they sign the document. So if they break the word, you can shoot them. Uh, there is a bit of a risk involved in, in breaking it, but also it's not, um, it's not the done thing. Um, yeah, it does rely a little bit on, on honor, yes. Uh, but also you can exchange prisoners who are already back at home. So prisoner exchanges can also be, I know this happens as late as the American Civil War still, that you simply say, okay, well, you parole 200 of my guys and we parole 200 of your guys. So let's exchange names and they can go back and fight for, for, uh, for our own side. Um, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, if there are any artifacts in the museum in Tobago. So maybe, and I myself am not familiar with the, um, that's another question, by the way. I myself am not familiar with the Dutch artifacts that are housed in the museum in Tobago. So maybe that's something that we could uh, look at in a further lecture and we could probably get back, um, yeah. get back to you with an answer. Mr. Proudfoot, I see in the chat. So moving on, we have a question about Dutch Fort overlooking Scarborough. Um, did you, in, in your, in the preparation for your lecture, did you, did you look at that fort in, in particular? Let's see, Dutch Fort. So I, yeah, I, uh, I would think that that's, that's the remains or the, the situation for where the fort was. Mm -hmm. Because the, the, the earlier, um, um, so the Dutch settlements on Tobago were in under other locations. Uh, so for the, the earlier you know, Lomsensburg and, and uh, other settlements are not here. So as far as I know, this is the only real fort that the, the Dutch build in, in Scarborough. Okay. All right, um, moving on, we have a question about, well, well, Mr. Kenny in the, in, the, in the chat says there are no remains of Dutch ports. Yeah. That's interesting. It's, mm -hmm. You can already see that in that last image, early 18th yeah. century, you have sort of very faint outlines of, and it was only even at the best of times, which was also very much the worst of times, uh, it was only an earthwork fort. So there's no stone outer walls. It's simply piled up sort of pack together earth with palisades to make sure that you can simply run into the place. Um, so even if it hadn't been blown up, if you don't maintain a fort like that, the rains mean that it's going to wash away. Mm. Um, and it's only, Benkis refers in the image, in the letters to the fact that they continually have to keep working even on the small fort because the rains mean that it's, it's continually at risk of falling apart. Uh, and we, we, need, we know that for Brazil as well. You'd think that they would have come up with sort of, <laughs> they, they'd realize by now that earthwork forts don't really work and you, you kind of need masonry walls, otherwise it's simply gonna wash away, but um, yeah. Well, I guess um, the time it took to create um, stone forts, um, well, using materials like stone, may have not been with them, time may not have been on their side to do that. Maybe that's, that's yeah. Funny. Yeah, I think that's very much the issue here um, that they need to get something up as soon as possible. Um, yeah. Okay. All right, so we move on now to the diseases. Um, a question here, were malaria and yellow fever the main causes of illness and are there figures of mortality due to the combat? So um, it's difficult to say with certainty, of course, now what, which diseases exactly uh, caused uh, uh, the death, but I think yellow fever especially fits the profile well. I think if you look at the, um, it really starts to hit the fleet after Marie Galante and St. Martin as they take on board um, enslaved Africans and planters from these islands. Likely what they're also doing when they take people on board is that they're also bringing um, vectors for the illness on board of the fleet. And it really ravages uh, the fleet very, very quickly. 
Um, yes, there are figures for mortality in the battle, in both battles, uh, but those are not numbers that I have right at the top of my head, uh, but they are in the literature, yes. Okay, great. Well, that is interesting. It would be an interesting um, study to see if we could find out, you know, what were the causes of these mortalities and what illnesses were um, were there at that point in time. Um, okay, so I have a question for you. Um, you mentioned a bit about the, the aftermath of the battle where the enslaved Africans um, on the island were um, left to, to go into the interior of the island for fear that they would just, would just be taken up by the French, I think, that what we yeah. after the battle. So could you expand on that? Because that's a very interesting thing, um, interesting topic, because we may have an instance maybe of uh, maybe a, a community in the, in the interior that we don't know about. So that'd be interesting to expand on. Yeah, so it's referred, uh, I think, already at the first battle, when the French fleet approaches, uh, mm -hmm. that it's mentioned that, so there are a number of uh, enslaved people still on board one of the ships that burns, so they die. Um, but, um, and this is, remember, this fits in the whole Caribbean raid. They had gone to, to Cayenne and to Marie-Galante and to St. Martin, and they had captured people from French-owned plantations, hoping to build up a plantation colony in Tobago. Now, yeah. at St. Martin, I think they take on board 80 enslaved people, and he refers that all the plantation owners at St. Martin had also told or ordered the slaves on the plantations to flee into the mountain, so flee into the interior, so that they wouldn't be captured by the Dutch. And of course, then the Dutch say, oh, they told all kinds of lies about us that we would drink their blood, et cetera, et cetera, sort of making it a very um, um, fear-inspiring prospect of being captured by the Dutch, but they still take some people on board there. So I think they're trying to mimic what the French did more or less successfully on St. Martin is that order or let people escape into the interior. And then with the understanding that if you win the battle, you can always try and recapture these people. But if, because of course, uh, they're not sending them into the interior well provisioned and with tools and weapons and clothes, it's simply, um, Good luck and and get out of here. Um, so it's, I think it's very likely that most people who would be sent out died, simply because what we know for maroon communities later on, also in the Guyanas, for example, is that especially the in the initial phases they tend to, these communities of of then runaway slaves tend to remain quite close to the plantations so that they can take supplies from the plantations, remain in contact with people, but also steal tools so that they can build up their own community. So by sending people out into the interior without any of that, and then after the Battle of December uh, 1677, without a, a remaining settlement that they can sort of link back to occasionally, mm -hmm. If, if, they, if there would be a community that, that survives that, they're really very tough. Um, that would be sort of quite awe-inspiring. Uh, but we can also see then from the English side is that there are, they try to capture these people as well. And in this case, the right, the right between, very much between sort of quotation marks, but the right to capture runaway slaves on Tobago is granted by the English king to one of his followers in the Caribbean. So it's as if it's a resource that's being being traded or, or granted to somebody. Um, yeah, so I would I would be hesitant to, to, to suggest that anybody survive that, um, although that would be would be worthwhile looking at later reports and descriptions of the island if any mention is made still of, uh, of, of communities of runaways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a question here from Professor Brereton. She asks, to get a sense of the scope of the events 
roughly how many men, land and sea, did Binkis have in March 1677? And I can't pronounce the name. They illustrate in this, yeah, sorry. <laughs> in December 1677, my French is terrible. The say, oh, yeah. let's see. Um, oh, I would have to look that up. French losses really are quite, French lose, uh, wait. Uh, that is in French. I see if I can look that up right now. Uh, oh, uh, uh, I would have to look that up. Okay. They, they are quite, I think the F Dutch force when it leaves the Netherlands is something like, Oh, a thousand men, but I'm not sure if that's only the soldiers or I have this written down somewhere, but I can't find it right now. So I, I'm afraid that I'm going to have to duck that answering that one uh, definitively, but perhaps that'll come back uh, later as well. Okay. And also, um, I ask you to put your email address in the chat. So if there's any anything else that we don't cover today and someone else would like to hear about they can contact you by email. Yeah. All right. I'll put that in here. Also, I was thinking in terms of the images and the because the Dutch National Archives have a lot of the the material that has to do with colonial history from the Dutch side has been scanned and is made available sort of the the archive doesn't claim copyright. So it's not with what you sometimes have with the American or the British archives that they scan it and then say, you still have to pay us if you want to use it. Um, but I thought perhaps I can get in touch with the, the shared cultural heritage program at the Dutch National Archives to see if they, have, they can have this stuff scanned as well. Because then if people want to look at it or, or use the images, you can just download it in a very high resolution from the archive website. Um, so perhaps that's something I'll I will check that if they decide to do it I'll uh, I'll let you guys know. Mm -hmm. and, and if they do decide to do that, that'd be great because we have of course a national archives in, in Trinidad and Tobago, and yeah. we would take great care of those um, files and whatever it is that they send. Um, so yeah, so we'd be very most grateful for that. I'm sure Tobago in particular would be most grateful for. For that information yeah so okay so in wrapping up thank you so much for for answering these questions i'm not seeing any more questions in your chat right now so what we will do now i will pass it on to um miss margaret mcdowell hopefully she is there um to, to close us off today to do some closing um, remarks oh dr guy you want to say something first yeah okay. i would go ahead yes i would just like to say thank you and just to give some information, um, Ms. Margaret McDowell, she would give um, other particulars. Um, Professor Ari Beaumont will be here next, next week, December 3rd. He is an archaeologist and historian from the University of Leiden. And he also lectured at UWE and did some work on Fort Monk. So we would be pleased to have him. And I just want to say that I want to thank um, Eric just personally, and I let Margaret do the rest. Thank you. And thanks again to everyone for coming out. Thank you, Dr. Guy. And thank you, all of us. Well, first of all, Professor Eric Odegaard, uh, we, we are blown away. I mean, the amount of research as well that this would have taken to be able to get this information. We were very excited. I'm a geographer uh, of my, my, heart, my heart. So you can imagine how excited I was when I was seeing all these maps and diagrams and thinking of the, the, the kind of technology at the time to be able to produce these kinds of maps and look at scale, you know, was just really amazing. Um, I really want to rec recognize of, of all the people who you have gone to to get this information, the Dutch Nat National Archives in particular, and, um, and I want to um, echo Ashley's um, support um, of, of getting a lot of this documentation. And I know that the archives here would be very interested in having um, some of this 
information as well. So thank you very much. This is just expanding our reach um, and particularly the interest in terms of how people thought you know, of naval battles and strategy and so on then, and how it happens now. And I am sure there's some naval strategists who are listening in who might be very interested as well. And I recognize all of our participants. I'm seeing um, Kevin Kenny, our good friend, Kevin Kenny, who spearheaded not just the, the getting the information, and I think you have all almost a, a lot of this information at your fingertips as well, but also creating that wonderful, um, video film um, documentary slash well not really a documentary but a, a really imaginative but very true to form um, film and i'm sure now that everybody's been in this that you'll be all very interested in seeing the the film again so kevin we have to figure out how best to get this film back up on the road again i'm sure you'll be very willing to work with us on that so thank you so much for that. I, of course, the Dutch embassy here, you know, to bring this together. We have all our friends from Tobago. I keep seeing the names coming up. You know, I'm very, very excited about this. Um, I, so I really want to thank everyone. But I also want to remind the people to tell all your friends that even now you can still register. And if you can't see it at 10 o'clock or whatever time it is around the world that you are seeing it now, that you can look at our links. And I see Ty smiling there and Ty will promise to again remind everybody about the various links for all four lectures so far. We're having a wonderful role. Um, I know that next week, you just heard what's on next week. And so I really want to, not only thank you, but thank you in advance for being at the lecture next week, Friday. This is our Friday thing that we want to do. So thank you all very much. And thank you particularly to Dr. Guy, who has really pulled out all the stops. And by the way, Dr. Guy and her friends in Tobago have this wonderful exhibition in the Scarborough Library. And so I really would like people to go there and see that, those who can get across to Tobago and those who are fortunate enough to be in Tobago right now, I really would like you to see that exhibition. It's really very exciting. So Dr. Guy, once again, thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you all next week, Friday, 10 o'clock, our time, everybody else's time, be there. Thank you, bye-bye.